Hello everyone, Thersites the Historian here. Last time we looked at H.G. Wells as the outline of history, we looked at his treatment of the mechanical and industrial revolutions, or as they're known today, the first and second industrial revolutions. This is part of my attempt to get at H.G. Wells' understanding of the history of the left. Um, people on Discord and other places have asked me to do something like a history of the left, so I figured why not get H.G. Wells' viewpoint on it since he was a lefty who lived over a hundred years ago. I feel like that's a good sort of midpoint between the origins of the left and where things stand today. And today we get to the point where he lays out what the left had accomplished by his time and where things stood. I must recommend now, if you have not seen the previous video where he went through the first and second industrial revolutions, I strongly suggest that you look at that first before watching this video since his view is fundamentally materialist insofar as political ideology stems from material circumstances on the ground. So if you want to know what he thinks was happening in uh, material terms, you need to watch those videos first. So there are some notes here that I have that we need to go through before we get to Wells' text itself. First of all, as always, I must remind all of you that H.G. Wells was in fact an extremely British, British man. As a Brit, he has to downplay the French Revolution, so as with previous videos, we'll see that the French Revolution apparently had very little to do with the formation of the left. This viewpoint is not held by most other scholars, but for Wells, this is something of a truism, that the French Revolution was kind of this false start, which had no real impact beyond um, the time when Napoleon rose to power. He also therefore puts the beginning at 1848 when things spread beyond France because the French cannot really have full credit unless it is shared with others. And because, again, H.G. Wells is extraordinarily British, the true father of socialism is not Karl Marx, who was German, but rather Robert Owen, who was a British industrialist. Now, Owen is very important, and, and Wells does a great job of arguing for his importance and introducing him to the general reader, but he really is more of a benevolent boss than a socialist. He's much more of a proto-Henry Ford than a theorist of any kind of class struggle or class-based politics. Owen's ideas evolved over time, as Wells points out, but it's not really political so much as Owen was just a humanitarian and an overall good guy. He was somewhat of a patriarch for his followers, and I think that he's better understood in that light than as somebody who had any real sustained political ideology. Wells also shows a strong interest in currency throughout this segment. He talks about the need to make sure that workers are paid a currency which is commensurate with what they expected to receive. So in this way, he seems to be participating in the concerns of people such as William Jennings Bryan. If you'll recall the failed presidential contenders video that I did with Sean a few weeks ago, um, Brian was very much concerned with what was known as bimetallism, the idea being that the economy should be based on silver rather than gold because silver allows for a little bit more inflation, which he thought would be better for workers. For Wells, the idea seems to be almost the opposite, that currency should be held steady, so that way if a worker does a certain amount of work, and gets paid a wage, it will be sustained in value. His fear was that the wage would hold at a certain level, and then inflation would render that wage effectively much less than what it should be. So this shows that there are contemporary um, concerns about the value of money, and those are concerns which continue to this day, albeit in a different form. We no longer really adhere to any kind of metal standards, but the basic problem of inflation remains. So, around 1920, which is when H.G. Wells originally published this outline, we see that he gives an assessment of where socialism stands and its various problems. And I think that this is his most impressive contribution here, even though this is only about a five-page section. Everything that he says still sounds relevant, even if some of the conditions which underlie uh, politics 1920 versus 2020 have changed significantly. What H.G. Wells says effectively is that it's very hard to delineate hard and fast separations between 
capitalism and socialism at some points. For instance, if you look at syndicalism, it effectively is capitalism, but with more representation for workers. And he says that it's therefore hard to really promote it. It's hard to really sell the benefits of it because the differences are somewhat difficult to detect. They're a little bit on the subtle side. I think that remains the case. Have you ever seen Vosch try to explain syndicalism? It can be a somewhat painful process. Um, he also says that in order to get anywhere in a revolution or social movement, you have to build up a lot of public support before you move forward. And this is still a problem. Many people don't understand what socialism is today, and they view it as something of a boogeyman. This has been after decades and decades of Cold War era propaganda. There are people who think of people being pro-gay marriage as being communist, for instance. Uh, there's not a lot of trust behind the word socialist in North America, at least in the United States. And this is very frustrating, especially when most people who really bash socialism don't exactly have a very clear idea of what it is or even what Karl Marx stood for. So if anything, this problem's gotten worse since Wells's day. And that problem was really starting in Wells's day because of the Bolshevik revolution and the impact that that had on contemporary um, more conservative-minded intellectuals who then sort of had a knee-jerk reaction against anything associated with socialism. He also says that before any revolutionary movements go forward, before any reform movements go forward, I guess you could even say, you really need to have a well-thought-out solution prior to trying to implement anything. You need to make sure that your ideas are solid and well-founded. And to get to that point, he thinks that what we need is a more regular and intellectual social scientific cadre, which can study these problems and then uh, present their solutions, test them, and implement them. So basically what he was looking for is something akin to an organized academia or organized think tanks, both of which we now have. The problem is that even though the people he called eccentric individuals are now organized and have institutional support, they still don't have a hell of a lot of influence contrary to what people on the right say. The only way to get influence as an academic is to say something which either completely distracts from the problems of class, so you can speak power to speak truth to power, but you can't do anything that involves class, or you have to say something that is compatible with corporate power directly. So if you're an economist who is on the right wing side of things, you can get quite a bit of airtime with Prager University or Fox News or what have you. Or if you want to boil down all of America's problems to race, you can also get a great deal of airtime. If, however, you point out class inequities, if you're, say, Richard Wolff, good luck getting on the news. Good luck getting on any program that is remotely mainstream or has a major viewership. So... Wells' solution effectively did come true and failed to work. So in that regard, that little part of his um, treatment of socialism has not aged particularly well. Let's see. Um, he also says something interesting, something that probably will not endear him with most people who are a little skeptical of socialism. He says that Marxism of necessity must be globalist, that Marx never fully realized this, but that if you were saying that people are more bound by class than by any other um, thing, then you must prioritize class over nationality, and that the goal must be a one-world government where everyone is represented and where class interests come first. Effectively, he thinks that, there sh that countries should become states or territories within a larger framework of a proletariat ruled world. And I think that logically speaking, his inference here is correct, and that this is the logical corollary of Marxist doctrine. He also thinks that this would do a good job of trying to limit class conflict, or not class conflict, excuse me, but of war between nations. Um, I think that he's probably correct about that, in theory at least. He also says that one of the great problems that faces socialists is that World War I proved that in spite of all the rhetoric that people have about class, at least all the people he knows in his time, when push came to shove, they put their nation above their class interest and they backed the war machine, often with 
absolutely devastating, if not catastrophic, results? Well, I would have to say that in the hundred years since H.G. Wells published his book, no progress has been made. Not a bit. Nationality still comes before class for most people. If there was a great war and a call for people to rally behind the flag and fight poor people abroad, poor people here would be all for it. And they would do so with great fanfare. So the problem has remained exactly where it stood 100 years ago. No progress has been made. And that is in spite of the claims of some conservatives, such as R.R. R. Reno, who really decry the downfall of patriotism and the downfall of all Western values and confidence in the West. The fact remains that when push comes to shove, people today are still more nationalist than classist. And that is in itself, I think, an indictment of our entire educational system and also an indictment of all of the decades and decades and decades of anti-socialist propaganda, which in many ways was tailored to make sure that workers can't organize and get a better wage. But I don't want to get too much into my concerns. I've talked too long already. Let's see what H.G. Wells has to say in his own words in sections five through seven of his excellent work. Chapter 37, The Realities and Imaginations of the 19th Century. Section 3, The Fermentation of Ideas, 1848. To trace any broad outlines in the fermentation of ideas that went on during the mechanical and industrial revolution of the 19th century is a very difficult task, but we must attempt it if we are to link what has gone before in this history with the condition of our world today. It will be convenient to distinguish two main periods in the hundred years between 1814 and 1914. First came the period 1814 to 1848, in which there was a very considerable amount of liberal thinking and writing in limited circles, but during which there were no great changes or development of thought in the general mass of the people. Throughout this period, the world's affairs were living, so to speak, on their old intellectual capital. They were going on in accordance with the leading ideas of the revolution and the counter-revolution. The dominant liberal ideas were freedom and a certain vague equalitarianism. The conservative ideas were monarchy, organized religion, social privilege, and obedience. Until 1848, the spirit of the Holy Alliance, the spirit of Metternich, struggled to prevent a revival of the European Revolution that Napoleon had betrayed and set back. In America, both North and South, on the other hand, the revolution had triumphed and 19th century liberalism ruled unchallenged. Britain was an uneasy country, never quite loyally reactionary, nor quite loyally progressive, neither truly monarchist nor truly republican. The land of Cromwell and also of the merry monarch Charles. Anti-Austrian, anti-Bourbon, anti-Papal, yet weakly oppressive. We have told of the first series of liberal storms in Europe in and about the year 1830. In Britain in 1832, a reform bill, greatly extending the franchise and restoring something of its representative character to the House of Commons, relieved the situation. Round and about 1848 came a second and much more serious system of outbreaks that overthrew the Orléans monarchy and established a second republic in France, 1848-1852, raised North Italy and Hungary against Austria, the Poles in Poussin against the Germans, and sent the Pope in flight from the Republicans of Rome. A very interesting Pan-Slavic conference held at Prague foreshadowed many of the territorial readjustments of 1919. It dispersed after an insurrection at Prague had been suppressed by Austrian troops. The Hungarian insurrection was more vigorous and maintained the struggle for two years. Its leader was Louis Kossuth. Defeated and in exile, he still maintained a vigorous propaganda for the liberty of his people. Ultimately, all these insurrections failed. The current system staggered, but kept its feet. There were, no doubt, serious social discontents beneath these revolts, but as yet, 
except in the case of Paris. These had no very clear form, and this 1848 storm, so far as the rest of Europe was concerned, may be described in a phrase as a revolt of the natural political map against the artificial arrangements of the Vienna diplomatist and the system of suppressions these arrangements entailed. The history of Europe then, from 1815 to 1848, was, generally speaking, a sequel to the history of Europe from 1789 to 1814. There were no really new motifs in the composition. The main trouble was still the struggle, though often a blind and misdirected struggle, of the interest of ordinary men against the great power system which cramped and oppressed the life of mankind. But after 1848, from 1848 to 1914, though the readjustment of the map still went on towards a free and unified Italy and a unified Germany, there began a fresh phase in the process of mental and political adaptation to the new knowledge and the new material powers of mankind. Came a great interruption of new social, religious, and political ideas into the general European mind. In the next three sections, we will consider the origin and quality of these eruptions. They laid the foundations upon which we base our political thought today, but for a long time they had no very great impact on contemporary politics. Contemporary politics continued to run on the old lines, but with a steadily diminishing support in the intellectual convictions and consciences of men. We have already described the way in which a strong intellectual process undermined the system of grand monarchy in France before 1789. A similar undermining process was going on throughout Europe during the Great Power Period of 1848 to 1914. Profound doubts of the system of government and of the liberties of many forms of property in the economic system spread throughout the social body. Then came the greatest and most disorganizing war in history, so that it was impossible for those who lived immediately after it to estimate the power and range of the accumulated new ideas of those 66 years. They had been through a far greater catastrophe than the Napoleonic catastrophe, and were in a slack water period corresponding to the period 1815 to 1830. But neither in 1830 nor in 1848 came to show them where they stood. Section 4. The Development of the Idea of Socialism we have traced throughout this history the gradual restriction of the idea of property from the first unlimited claim of the strong man to possess everything, and the gradual realization of brotherhood as something transcending personal self-seeking. Men were first subjugated into more than tribal societies by the fear of monarch and deity. It is only within the last three or at most four thousand years that we have any clear evidence that voluntary self-abandonment to some greater end, without fee or reward, was an acceptable idea to men, or that anyone had propounded it. Then we find spreading over the surface of human affairs, as patches of sunshine spread and pass over the hillsides upon a windy day in spring, the idea that there is a happiness and self-devotion greater than any personal gratification or triumph and a life of mankind different and greater and more important than the sum of all the individual lives within it. We have seen that idea become vivid as a beacon, vivid as sunshine caught and reflected dazzlingly by some window in the landscape, in the teachings of Buddha, Lao Tzu, and most clearly of all, Jesus of Nazareth. Through all its variations and corruptions, Christianity has never completely lost the suggestion of a devotion to God's common will that makes the personal pomps of monarchs and rulers seem like the insolence of an overdressed servant, and the splendors and gratifications of wealth like the waste of robbers. No man living in a community which such a religion as Christianity or Islam has touched can be altogether a slave. There is an eradicable quality in these religions that compels men to judge their masters and to realize their own responsibility for the world. As men have felt their way towards this new state of mind from the fierce self-centered greed and instinctive combativeness of the early Paleolithic family group, 
They have sought to express the drift of their thoughts and necessities very variously. They have found themselves in disagreement and conflict with old established ideas, and there has been a natural tendency to contradict these ideas flatly, to fly over to the absolute contrary. Faced by a world in which rule and classes and order seem to do little but give opportunity for personal selfishness and unrighteous oppression, the first impatient movement was to declare for a universal equality and a practical anarchy. Faced by a world in which property seemed little more than a protection for selfishness and a method of enslavement, it was natural to repudiate all property. Our history shows an increasing impulse to revolt against rulers and against ownership. We have traced it in the Middle Ages, burning the rich men's chateaus and experimenting in theocracy and communism. In the French revolutions, this double revolt is clear and plain. In France, we find side by side, inspired by the same spirit and as natural parts of the same revolutionary movement, men who, with their eyes on the rulers' taxes, declared that property should be inviolable, and others who, with their eyes on the employer's hard bargains, declared that property should be abolished. But what they are really revolting against in each case is that the ruler and the employer, instead of becoming servants of the community, still remain, like most of mankind, self-seeking, oppressive individuals. Throughout the ages, we find this belief growing in men's minds, that there can be a rearrangement of laws and powers as to give rule and order while still restraining the egotism of any ruler and of any ruling class that may be necessary, and such a definition of property as will give freedom without oppressive power. We begin to realize nowadays that these ends are only to be attained by a complex constructive effort. They arise through the conflict of new human needs against ignorance and old human nature. But throughout the 19th century, there was a persistent disposition to solve the problem by some simple formula. And be happy ever afterwards, regardless of the fact that all human life, all life, is throughout the ages nothing but the continuing solution of a continuous synthetic problem. The earlier half of the 19th century saw a number of experiments in the formation of trial human societies of a new kind. Among the most important historically were the experiments and ideas of Robert Owen, 1771-1858, a Manchester cotton spinner. He is very generally regarded as the founder of modern socialism. It was in connection with his work that the word socialism first arose, about 1835. He seems to have been a thoroughly competent businessman. He made a number of innovations in the cotton spinning industry, and acquired a fair fortune at an early age. He was distressed by the waste of human possibilities among his workers, and he set himself to improve their condition and the relations of employer and employed. This he sought to do at his Manchester factory, and afterwards at New Lanark, where he found himself in practical control of works employing about 2,000 people. Between 1800 and 1828, he achieved very considerable things. He reduced the hours of labor, made his factory sanitary and agreeable, abolished the employment of very young children, improved the training of his workers, provided unemployment pay during a period of trade depression, established a system of schools, and made New Lanark a model of a better industrialism, while at the same time sustaining its commercial prosperity. He wrote vigorously to defend the mass of mankind against the charges of intemperance and improvidence which were held to justify the economic iniquities of the time. He held that men and women are largely the product of their educational environment, a thesis that needs no advocacy today. And he set himself to a propaganda of the views that New Lanark had justified. He attacked the selfish indolence of his fellow manufacturers and, in 1819, largely under his urgency, the first Factory Act was passed, the first attempt to restrain employers from taking the most stupid and intolerable advantages of their workers' poverty. Some of the restrictions of that act amaze us today. It seems incredible now that it should ever have been necessary to protect little children of nine from work in factories. 
or to limit the nominal working day of such employees to 12 hours. Peoples are perhaps too apt to write of the Industrial Revolution as though it led to the enslavement and overworking of poor children who had hit hereto been happy and free. But this misinterprets history. From the very beginnings of civilization, the little children of the poor had always been obliged to do whatever work they could do. But the factory system gathered up all this infantile toil and made it systematic, conspicuous, and scandalous. The factory system challenged the quickening human conscience on that issue. The British Factory Act of 1819, weak and feeble though it seems to us, was the Magna Carta of childhood. Thereafter, the protection of the children of the poor, first from toil and then from bodily starvation and ignorance, began. We cannot tell here in any detail the full story of Owen's life and thought. His work at New Lanark had been, he felt, only a trial upon a small working model. What could be done for one industrial community could be done, he held, for every industrial community in the country. He advocated a resettlement of the industrial population in townships on New Lanark plan. For a time, he seemed to have captured the imagination of the world. The Times and Morning Post supported his proposals. Among the visitors to New Lanark was the Grand Duke Nicholas, who succeeded Alexander I as Tsar. A fast friend was the Duke of Kent, son of George III and father of Queen Victoria. But all the haters of change, and all, and there are always many such, who were jealous of the poor, and all the employers who were likely to be troubled by his projects, were waiting for an excuse to counterattack him, and they found it in the expression of his religious opinions, which were hostile to official Christianity. And through those, he was successfully discredited. But he continued to develop his projects and experiments, of which the chief was a community at New Harmony in Indiana, in which he sank most of his capital. His partners bought him out of the new Lanark business in 1828. Owen's experiments and suggestions range very widely, and do not fall under any single formula. There was nothing doctrinaire about him. His new Lanark experiment was the first of a number of benevolent businesses in the world. Lord Lever Hulme's Port Sunlight, the Cadbury's Bourneville, and the Ford businesses in America are contemporary instances and an approach towards communism. His proposals for state settlements were what we should call state socialism today. His American experiment and his later writings point to a completer form of socialism, a much wider departure from the existing state of affairs. It is clear that the riddle of currency exercised Owen. He understood that we can no more hope for real economic justice while we pay for work out of money, out of paperwork with money of fluctuating value, then we could hope for a punctual world if there was a continual inconstant variability in the length of an hour. One of his experiments was an attempt at a circulation of labor notes representing one hour, five hours, or twenty hours of work. The cooperative societies of today, societies of poor men which combine for the collective buying and distribution of commodities or for collective manufacture or dairying or other forms of agriculture, arose directly out of his initiatives though the pioneer cooperative societies of his own time ended in failure. Their successors have spread throughout the whole world and number today some 30 or 40 million of adherents. A summary of their activities will be found in the Work, Wealth, and Happiness of Mankind. A point to note about this early socialism of Owens is that it was not at first at all democratic. The democratic idea was mixed up with it later. Its initiative was benevolent, its early form patriarchal. It was something up to which the workers were to be educated by liberally disposed employers and leaders. The first socialism was not a workers' movement, it was a master's movement. Throughout its history, the ideology of socialism has been the work mainly of men, not workers. Marx is described by Beer as an aristocrat, Engels was a merchant. Lenin, an exiled member of a landowning family. Concurrently with this work of Owens, 
another and quite independent series of developments was going on in America and in Britain, which was designed to come at last into relation with his socialistic ideas. The English law had long prohibited combinations and restraint of trade, combinations to raise prices or wages by concerted action. There had been no great hardship in these prohibitions before the agrarian and industrial changes of the 18th century let loose a great swarm of workers living from hand to mouth and competing for in insufficient employment. Under these new conditions, the workers in many industries found themselves intolerably, intolerably squeezed. They were played off one another against one another. Day by day and hour by hour, none knew what concession his fellow might not have made, and what further reduction of pay or increase of toil might not ensue. It became vitally necessary for the workers to make agreements, illegal though they were, against such underselling. At first, these agreements had to be made and sustained by secret societies, or clubs established ostensibly for quite other purposes. Social clubs, funeral societies, and the like served to mask the wage-protecting combination. The fact that these associations were illegal disposed them to violence. They were savage against blacklegs and rats who would not join them, and still more savage with traitors. In 1824, the House of Commons recognized the desirability of relieving tension in these matters by conceding the right of workmen to form combinations for collective bargaining with the masters. This enabled trade unions to develop with a large measure of freedom. At first, very clumsy and primitive organizations, and with very restricted freedoms, the trade unions have risen gradually to be a real fourth estate in the country, a great system of bodies representing the mass of industrial workers. Arising at first in Britain and America, they have, with various national modifications and under varying legal conditions, spread to France, Germany, and all the westernized communities. Organized originally to sustain wages and restrict intolerable hours, the trade union movement was at first something altogether distinct from socialism. The trade unionist tried to make the best for himself of the existing capitalism and the existing conditions of employment. The socialist proposed to change the system. It was the imagination and generalizing power of Karl Marx which brought these two movements into relationship. He was a man with the sense of history very strong in him. He was one of the first to perceive that the old social classes which had endured since the beginning of civilization were in the process of disillusion and regrouping. His racial Jewish commercialism made the antagonism of property and labor very plain to him, and his upbringing in Germany, where, as we have pointed out, the tendency of class to harden in the caste was more evident than any other European country, made him conceive of labor as presently becoming class conscious and collectively antagonistic to the property concentrating classes. In the trade union movement, which was spreading over the world, he believed he saw this development of class conscience labor. What, he asked, would be the outcome of the class war of the capitalist and proletariat? The capitalist adventurers, he alleged, because of their inherent greed and combativeness, would gather power over capital into fewer and fewer hands, until at last they would concentrate all the means of production, transit, and the like into a form seizable by the workers, whose class consciousness and solidarity would be developed peri passu by the process of organizing and concentrating industry. They would seize this capital and work it for themselves. This would be the social revolution. Then, individual property and freedom would be restored based on the common ownership of the earth and the management by the community as a whole of the great productive services which the private capitalist had organized and concentrated. This would be the end of the capitalist system, but not the end of the system of capitalism. State capitalism would replace private owner capitalism. This marks a great stride away from the socialism of Owen. Owen, like Plato, looked to the common sense of men of any or every class to reorganize the casual and faulty political, economic, and social structure. Marx found something more in the nature of a driving force in class hostility based on expropriation and injustice. And he was not simply a prophetic 
theorist. He was also a propagandist of the revolt of labor, the revolt of the so-called proletariat. Labor, he perceived, had a common interest against the capitalist everywhere. Though under the test of the great power wars of the time, and particularly of the liberation of Italy, he showed that he failed to grasp the fact that labor everywhere has a common interest in the peace of the world. But with the social revolution in view, he did succeed in inspiring the formation of an international league of workers, the first international. The subsequent history of socialism was checkered between the British tradition of Owen and the German class feeling of Marx. What was called Fabian Socialism, the exposition of socialism by the London Fabian Society, made its appeal to reasonable men of all classes. What was called revisionism and German socialism inclined in the same direction. But on the whole, it was Marx who carried the day against Owen. And the general disposition of socialists throughout the world was to look to the organization of labor, and labor only, to supply the fighting forces that would disentangle the political and economic organization of human affairs from the hands of the more or less irresponsible private owners and adventurers who controlled it. These were the broad features of the project called socialism. We will discuss its incompleteness and inadequacies in our next section. It was perhaps inevitable that socialism should be greatly distraught and subdivided by doubts and disputes in sects and schools. They are growth symptoms like the spot on a youth's face. Here we can but glance at the difference between state socialism, which would run the economic business of the country through its political government, and the later schools of syndicalism and guild socialism which would entrust a large measure in the government of each industry to the workers of every grade, including the directors and managers, engaged in that industry. This guild socialism is, rare, is really a new sort of capitalism with a committee of workers and officials in each industry taking the place of the free private capitalist of that industry. The industrial personnel becomes the collective capitalist. Section 5 Shortcomings of Socialism as a Scheme of Human Society We are all socialists nowadays, said Sir William Harcourt years ago, and that is loosely true today. There can be few people who fail to realize the provisional nature and the dangerous instability of our present political and economic system, and still fewer who believe with the doctrinaire individualist that profit hunting, go as you please, will guide mankind to any haven of prosperity and happiness. Great rearrangements are necessary, and a systematic legal subordination of personal self-seeking to the public good. So far, most reasonable men are socialist. But these are only preliminary propositions. How far has socialism and modern thought generally gone towards working out the conception of this new political and social order? of which our world admittedly stands in need. We are obliged to answer that there is no clear conception of the new state towards which we vaguely struggle, that our science of human relationships is today so crude and speculative as to leave us without definite guidance upon a score of primarily important issues. Today, we are no more in a position to set up a scientifically conceived political system in the world then were men to set up an electric power station in 1825. They could not have done that then to save their lives. The Marxist system points us to an accumulation of revolutionary forces in the modern world. These forces will continually tend towards revolution. But Marx assumed too hastily that a revolutionary impulse would necessarily produce an ordered state of a new and better kind. A revolution may stop halfway in mere destruction. No socialist sect has yet defined its projected government clearly. The Bolsheviks in their Russian experiment seem to have been guided by a phrase, the dictatorship of the proletariat, and Stalin has proved as autocratic as the equally well-meaning Tsar Alexander I. We have been at some pains to show from our brief study of the French Revolution that a revolution can establish nothing permanent that has not already been thought out beforehand and apprehended by the general mind. The French Republic, 
confronted with unexpected difficulties in economics, currency, and international relationships, collapse to the egotisms of the newly rich people of the Directory, and finally to the egotism of Napoleon. Law and a plan, steadily upheld, are more necessary in revolutionary times than in ordinary humdrum times, because in revolutionary times society degenerates much more readily into a mere scramble under the ascendancy of the forcible and cunning. If in general terms we take stock of the political and social science of our age, we shall measure something of the preliminary intellectual task still to be done by mankind before we can hope to see any permanent constructive achievements emerging from the mere traditionalism and adventuring that rule our collective affairs today. This socialism, which professes to be a complete theory of a new social order, we discover, when we look into it, to be no more than a partial theory, very illuminating, so far as it goes, about property. We have already discussed the relationship of social development to the restriction of the idea of property. There are various schools of thought which would restrict property more or less completely. Communism is the proposal to abolish property altogether, or in other words, to hold all things in common. Modern socialism, on the other hand, or to give it a more precise name, collectivism, does clearly distinguish between personal property and collective property. The gist of the socialist proposal is that land and all the natural means of production, transit, and distribution should be collectively owned. Within these limits, there is to be much more private, free private ownership and unrestricted personal freedom. Given efficient administration, it may be doubted whether many people nowadays would dispute that proposal. But socialism has never gone on to a thorough examination of that proviso for efficient administration. Again, what community is it that is to own the collective property? Is it to be the sovereign, or the township, or the county, or the nation, or mankind? Socialism makes no clear answer. Socialists are very free with the word nationalize, but we have been subjecting the ideas of nations and nationalism to some destructive criticism in this outline. If socialists object to a single individual claiming a mine or a great stretch of agricultural land as his own industrial property, with a right to refuse or barter its use and property to others, why should they permit a single nation to monopolize the mines or trade routes or natural wealth of the territories in which it lives against the rest of mankind? There seems to be great confusion in socialist theory in this matter. And unless human life is to become a mass meeting of the race and permanent session, how is the community to appoint its officers to carry on its collective concerns? After all, the private owner of land or of a business or the like is a sort of public official insofar as his ownership is sanctioned and protected by the community. Instead of being paid a salary or fees, he is allowed to make a profit. The only valid reason for dismissing him from his ownership is that the new control to be substituted will be more efficient and profitable and satisfactory to the community. And being dismissed, he has at least the same claim to consideration from the community that he himself has shown in the past to the worker thrown out of employment by a mechanical invention. This question of administration, the sound and adequate bar to much immediate socialization, brings us to the still largely unsolved problem of human association. How are we to secure the best direction of human affairs and the maximum of willing cooperation with that directive? This is ultimately a complex problem in psychology but it is absurd to pretend that it is an insoluble one. There must be a definable best, which is the right thing in these matters. But if it is not insoluble, it is equally unreasonable to pretend that it has been solved. The problem in its completeness involves the working out of the best methods in the following departments and their complete correlation. One, education the preparation of the individual for an understanding and willing cooperation in the world's affairs. Two, information. The continual truthful presentation of public affairs to the individual for his judgment and approval. Closely connected with this need for current information is the codification of the law, the problem of keeping the law plain, clear, and accessible to all. Three, representation. 
the selection of representatives and agents to act in the collective interest in harmony with the general will based on this education and plain information. 4. The Executive The appointment of executive agents and the maintenance of means for keeping them responsible to the community without at the same time hampering intelligent initiatives. 5. Thought and Research The systematic criticism of affairs and laws to provide data for popular judgments and through these judgments to ensure the secular improvement of the human organization. These are the five heads under which the broad problem of human society presents itself to us. In the world around us, we see makeshift devices at work in all those branches, ill-coordinated one with another and unsatisfactory in themselves. We see an educational system meanly financed and equipped, badly organized, and crippled by the interventions and hostilities of religious bodies. We see popular information supplied chiefly by a venal press dependent upon advertisements and subsidies. We see farcical methods of election returning, election returning politicians to power as unrepresentative as any hereditary ruler or casual conqueror. Everywhere the executive is more or less influenced or controlled by groups of rich adventurers, and the pursuit of political and social science and of public criticism is still the work of devoted and eccentric individuals rather than a recognized and honored function in the state. There is a gigantic task before right-thinking men in the cleansing and sweetening of the politician's stable. And until it is done, any complete realization of socialism is impossible. While private adventurers control the political life of the state, it is ridiculous to think of the state taking over collective economic interest from private adventurers. Not only has the socialist movement failed thus far to produce a scientifically reasoned scheme for the correlation of education, law, and the exercise of public power, but even in the economic field, as we have already pointed out, creative forces wait for the conception of a right organization of credit and a right method of payment and interchange. It is a truism that the willingness of the worker depends, among other things, upon his complete confidence in the purchasing power of the currency in which he is paid. As this confidence goes, work ceases, except in so far as it can be rewarded by payment in goods. But there is no sufficient science of currency and business psychology to restrain governments from the most disturbing interferences with the public credit and with the circulation. And such interferences lead straight to the cessation of work, that is, of the production of necessary things. Upon such vital practical questions, it is scarcely too much to say that the mass of these socialists who would recast the world have no definite ideas at all. Yet in a socialist world, quite as much as in any other sort of world, people must be paid money for their work rather than be paid in kind, if any such thing as personal freedom is to continue. Here too, there must be an ascertainable right thing to do. Until that is determined, history in these matters will continue to be not so much a record of experiments as of flounderings. And in another direction, the social and political thinking of the 19th century was, in the face of the vastness of the mechanical revolution, timid, limited, and insufficient, and that was in regard to international relations. The reader of socialistic literature will find the socialists constantly writing and talking of the state, and never betraying any realization that the state might be all sorts of organizations in all sorts of areas, from the Republic of San Marino to the British Empire. It is true that Karl Marx had a conception of a solidarity of interest between the workers in all the industrialized countries, but there is little or no suggestion in Marxist socialism of the logical corollary of this, the establishment of a democratic world federal government with national or provincial state governments, as a natural consequence of his projected social revolution. At most, there is a vague aspiration. But if there is any logic about the Marxist, it should be his declared public end for which he should work without ceasing. Put to the test of the War of 1914, the socialists of almost all the European countries showed that their class conscience internationalism was veneered very thinly indeed over their patriotic feelings, and had no degree replaced them. Everywhere during the German War, socialists announced that war as made by capitalist governments. 
but it produces little or no permanent effect to denounce a government or a world system unless you have a working idea of a better government and a better system to replace it. We state these things here because they are facts, and a living and necessary part of a contemporary survey of human history. It is not our present task either to advocate or controvert socialism, but it is in our picture to note that political and social life are and must remain chaotic and disastrous without the development of some such conclusive constructive scheme as socialism sketches, and to point out clearly how far away the world is at present from any such scheme. An enormous amount of intellectual toil and discussion and education, and many years, whether decades or centuries, no man can tell, must intervene before a new order, planned as ships and railways are planned, runs as the cables and the postal deliveries run over the whole surface of our earth. And until such a new order draws mankind together with its net, human life, as we shall presently show by the story of the European War since 1854, must become more and more casual, dangerous, miserable, anxious, and disastrous because of the continually more powerful and destructive war methods and continuing mechanical revolution produces. The work Wealth and Happiness of Mankind, the third part of the trilogy which includes this present outline and the science of life, is a preliminary survey of the existing conditions out of which this new world must arise.